Hey, uh, you, you know a little bit about this book, because Paul talked a little while ago about this. This is an incredible book. I just love this book. When, when I read it, it came in a really important time in my life. And, and people will criticize this. Did you know that, Paul? Yeah, I shouldn't have said that. I hurt your feelings. Um, people will say, where is that theology? There's no theology in that. What is that garbage, you know? But, uh, well, they wouldn't say it like that. They, they say, I respect Paul, but I would agree. Disag- yeah, right, I know. So anyway, this is, the, this is what I want to show you. This is called The Shack Revisited, and Baxter, sitting right by, right by Paul, wrote it. This is also one of my favorite books, and I love it because it's a pretty good, I th- well, I think it's a great exposition of, if you're hanging around seminary circles, Bardian theology and the Torrance brothers, and there's an incredible theological system behind what Paul says in this book. And, and what's so cool is it comes out of Paul's flesh, out of his experience, but that's the way the Logos is. The Logos takes on flesh. But that doesn't mean the Logos becomes illogical. Uh, it's uh, incredibly profound logic. So I just wanted to mention that, that I'd recommend both of those books. Right now, Paul, why don't you come on up, and now you can, uh, now you can preach. Like right. you, you haven't done that before. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> just, uh, just so you understand, here's another one. Did we get the green Subaru with the Utah plates taken care of? So, <laughs> so Baxter is a Mississippi storyteller. So, he, and, he, and he didn't set out to correct the shack, just so you know. <laughs> there are some of those books out there, like Burning Down the Shack. And um, <laughs> you laugh, you think I'm making that up. <clears throat> the... Uh, it's an it's incredible book. It's probably the best book, I think, that'll ever be written, at least in my lifetime, on the shack. And, uh, and I love Baxter, and I love Brad. I've got new friends now. So, um, but that happens a lot. I have a friend in Portland because of the shack uh, that I didn't know was there until I wrote it. And he, I'm working in this little manufacturer's rep warehouse, and he writes me a note, and it starts, and my boss, who's my friend, Mike, had said, why don't you just have your emails come in here? Because we were having kind of fun with this. People would come by and buy a case of the shack and give us money for it. And it was like, God, so this was like dealing drugs, you know? So, <laughs> so great. Well, I get an email that came in. I'm sitting there, and it says, you've ruined my life in the best possible way. And it turns out to be a man named Ronnie. And Ronnie uh, played semi-professional rugby for 25 years. He's uh, very much a man's man. And he is, um, he's just, he's a poet as well. Um, and an intercessor. And, uh, and so when he gets this, he says, I don't know if you ever, he says, I, I, I live in Portland and I don't know if you ever, um, uh, get a chance to go out to coffee or anything, but I love it. And he put my, his phone number. So I, the email comes in, and within 30 seconds, I call him, right? I read it, I call him. So where do you want to go to coffee? And he doesn't have a clue who's calling him, right? And I, and I know it. And, uh, and, he, and I say, uh, he says, well, um, I live in Park Rose. I said, yeah, I know. I'm working out in Clackamas, but I live in Gresham. He says, well, my wife works out in Gresham. I says, oh, that's great. So, um, uh, so we talk logistics for a couple minutes, and then he says, I got to ask. I get a lot of people who ask me to go to coffee and stuff, but who are you? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean, who am I? You're the one that sent me an email, asked me to go to coffee. And he goes, what? Are you kidding? Right. right. It was just so cool. So that, that afternoon, we met for coffee. And um, one of the connecting points is that um, when, I was, uh, when I was younger, I played rugby. And, uh, and it, it was, it was um, I, I used to be like six foot five. <laughs> rugby will do that to you. But, um, but uh, I, was, I was a hooker. And um, it's a position in rugby. Come on. <laughs> it, usually, it, it usually goes to one of the smaller guys on the team. And, uh, you know, it's a very... It's a difficult position, and, and uh, if you have a good team, you, you know, they'll go through two or three hookers in a season. And, um, but it's... So we, we connect on this issue of, uh, of rugby. 
So we go down to the city park after we have like a three-hour coffee break because we're going to go down and talk and meet his family. He wants me to meet his family. And um, we're, um, we're sitting at a picnic table at the, at the Gresham City Park. And I'm sitting on one side and Ronnie's next to me. And, a, and two of his big guy friends come up. One of them sits across from me and he says, so how do you know Ronnie? I said, well, we met on the internet. <laughs> and Ron, Ronnie's laying down on the ground. He's laughing so hard, right? <laughs> After that, I was always introduced. This is Paul. He's Ronnie's Canadian hooker. He met on the internet. <laughs> well, Ron is... Uh, he is such a good friend, and I've learned a lot of things from Ronnie. You know, every conversation is a two-way street. You get that? Because the Holy Spirit is not a respecter of persons and is, and is out to make all of us look really great. Because the Holy Spirit knows the truth about us, even if we don't. And um, one time, Ronnie, and I've, I've watched him do this a number of times in a conversation, and he will start it off by saying something like this. I just want you to know that at the end of this conversation, I don't want anything that is precious to you now to be less precious to you. Is that not sweet? And I think he's giving voice to something that a lot of us feel but don't know how to do. Right? Because we're, we have these two addictions, being right and being certain. So most of the time, we're certain we're right. <laughs> and it creates huge devastation in relationships. If, if you think I agree with you about everything, we just haven't talked enough yet. Right? This is not about us finding our unity in agreement. It's finding our unity in Jesus. And we're all in different ways, growing in different kinds of things. Different things are important to us. Different things matter to us. And the temptation is to establish a sense of certainty rather than understand that we are in the flow of mystery. And if you don't know you're in the flow of mystery, you're obviously not married. <laughs> when you enter marriage, you enter a mystery especially if you're a guy, and you, and you lose control. And so certainty and being right becomes an impediment. So I don't want anything that I talked to you about this morning to make anything that is precious to you now to be less precious to you. And the temptation in any kind of journey is to establish a new sense of certainty. And you see it all around us. I grew up in the church. We're all about finding a way to divide. There's a reason there are 44,000 denominations. We are experts at dividing. I found out last night that I'm a Christian Platonist. I'm not sure what that means and if I'm doing it right, but now I gotta think about all the things that I gotta figure out to make sure I'm doing it right. I don't know if there's kind of a ceremony you have to go through to become one, and I, I definitely didn't get the guide on it, and so I'm kind of in a quandary about it, and I've gotta add that to the list of other things that I already am. We love categorization because it puts people in a box so that we don't have to have relationships. That's why pornography is so powerful. It's the imagination of a relationship without any of the risks of a real one. So it becomes about positions of power and, and the fact that you can just, uh, you can love yourself through an imagination of a relationship. So we live in a world where the temptation is to, to divide and we get to be stealth special forces folks that resist it. Do you remember if you were introduced to Abram back in Genesis, if we had a scale of A to Z and Z, thank you, Brad and I, uh, but 
but if we had a scale for spiritual awareness and maturity, from A to Z, where would you put Abram in Genesis? I see, thank you, thank you. I'm tapping into one of America's greatest fears, embarrassment, right? What if I say it and it's wrong? I had one of my uh, grandchildren, we have nine grandkids that are nine and under. The nine-year-old, a couple years ago, he says to his dad, it's Gavin, he says, so dad, do you think Jesus ever made mistakes? And Chad says, well, that's a good question. What do you think? <laughs> if you think that comes from Brad, you haven't read the Gospels. Jesus is constantly responding to questions with questions because questions are an invitation to relationship, not just the establishment of certainty. So Chad says, so Gavin, what do you think? Gavin thinks about it and he says, yeah, yeah, I think Jesus made mistakes. I mean, how else would he learn anything? He didn't have a reputation for being a really good carpenter. <laughs> so you're Jesus of Nazareth. Hey, can I get a table? Like, because he makes perfect tables. They're always level. Right? And he never told stories about carpenters. Wonder why. Mistakes aren't sin, they're human. How else, and this is what Gavin said, well, how else, how else would he learn anything? It's okay. So, um, A to Z, I'm going to put Abram with one foot in A and one foot in B. Now, he doesn't know this. But, I mean, he's from Ur of the Chaldees. Give him a break. I mean, there's no seminaries there. There's, like, no churches. They don't have, you know, the canon, the scriptures. And they don't even have the Hebrew scriptures. There is a temple, but it's to Nanu and Ningal, the moon, and, moon god and goddess, and he lives there. This is his world. There's no local church. There's no outreach. There's no nothing. But, but, he hears voices. So he's got, because the people in A, they don't hear voices. But Abraham, he hears a voice. And the voice is so strong that he packs up everything he has and he moves out of town. He doesn't know where he's going. But, you know, it's, it's that. so he's got, a, he's got a foot in B. And he's got a foot in A. And... How theologically like astute is he about the character and nature of God? I told you, he's got a foot in A and a foot in B. And this voice that he's listening to, this revelation that he has, is strong enough to leave town. So, so if, if Abram's got a foot in A and a foot in B, where is God going to come to talk to Abram? Not at Q, right? God's not going to be down here. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, so hey, I'm over here. What's your problem? No. See, God's going to come to Abram. Say, let's, let's say Abram moved to B. So God's going to come with a foot in B and a foot in C. And he's going to go, Abram. And he's going to use Abram's language to help Abram move. But see, Abram's in B. Once you get to B, you think everybody in A is an idiot. What is wrong? Look, this is just logical. What, what we've got, I mean, it's just the answer. Those people, they're idiots. Now, people in C, they're nuts. So, we're going to make a church right here. We're going to build, build a church in B, and, it's, and our message is going to be to be or not to be. <laughs> right? Now, now God's going to come, and he's going to put a foot in B, and he's going to speak Abram's language. And Abram's language is sacrificial language. 
That's all he knows. The whole world is sacrificial language, appeasement theology. If you want God to do good things, you've got to sacrifice certain things to God. And it doesn't matter whether you're with the Aztecs or the Incans or the Egyptians or in Ur of the Chaldees, everybody is about sacrifice. And so the highest sacrifice, by the way, is what? Child sacrifice. That's Abram's language. Now, we have a little bit different perspective because somewhere along here, Jesus shows up, who is the Alpha and the Omega, and we know that God hates sacrifice. So we know that. But Abram doesn't know it. That's his language. So God says, all right, sacrifice your son. Abraham says, okay. Really? Doesn't that bother you a little bit? I mean, single guys might think that's all right, but, but once you have your own child, it's like, there's no way. I'm not going to do this. But Abraham, that's his language, right? And Hebrews says that Abraham thought, well, either God's going to raise him from the dead or give me a new one. Right? And by faith, he did it. From what he could see, he acted out of what he could see. What was the point? The point is that God's going to teach him something about who God is now that he didn't know. And he's going to teach him, Abram, listen to me. I want you to know right from the beginning that I do not require child sacrifice. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to let you think that I do, and then we're going to have a little conversation. Because Abraham doesn't argue about it. For three days, he goes up to the top of the mountain, and his son submits to it. And from what we can tell, his son's like 30 years old. We have this little picture of a 12-year-old, but even a 12-year-old should have a little, you know, he should have been chasing him down the mountainside, like when he got an idea of what was going on, you know. So this whole thing is that this becomes this necessary thing that God's requiring, and okay. Do you know that we do child sacrifice still? Lots of it. On the altar of our work, the whole military system is child sacrifice system in order to keep the God of personal security and safety at bay. It's the way the world works because they can't trust anybody. Right? So... Uh, one of our grandkids is Maisie. And Maisie uh, is adopted from Uganda, and uh, she's now four years old. And Maisie uh, was a throwaway child. And when my son and his wife, Andrew and Courtney, went over to Uganda to get her out of Uganda, it took them eight and a half weeks. And during that time in, in Jinja, the area that they were, six little boys went missing. A couple weeks later, two of them were found dehydrated and whatever, but, but they were found. The other four weren't found. And the most likely reason is that for $80 US, you can buy a child and the witch doctor will sacrifice them and put parts of their bodies into the corners of new construction and buildings and businesses. The reason these two weren't sacrificed is that they were circumcised and therefore they weren't perfect sacrifices. Sacrifice. Magic. If I have enough faith, I can get God to do something. If I do all the right stuff, I can get God to do something. It's magic. Twist God's arm because he's, he's not for us to begin with, so we have to convince him that he should be. And if we can pay the right thing, then we can get him to do the right thing. Craziness. But God says, come on. This is the passage that shattered the children of missionary kids. That if you were involved in the activities of God, you should be willing to sacrifice your children. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Abram. So he goes up there. The knife's coming down. God says, stop. And this is what God says. If you need a sacrifice, I will provide myself. Let me tell you a new name for me, Jehovah Jireh. First time it's used, the God who provides. Now Abraham's still stuck in his sacrificial system, so God gives him a goat. <laughs> okay. 
And it's later. Again, a lot of times we are in a movement, in a flow of the transformation of our own thinking. And allow yourself some breathing space in that and other people. Let's not build a new church based on this logical conclusion and, and create a new us and them. The point of inclusion is that we're all included in Jesus. So let's stay inside of Jesus in these conversations. I had uh, four of the grandkids, they were, they were in the back. And uh, we were driving along, and here's the conversation. L, she's eight. You can't just marry for money. I want to marry for love. Houston, who's six. I want to marry for love and money. <laughs> I like being rich. Maisie, you can't be a witch for Halloween. She's four. Ivy, five. What if there was a rich bone instead of a wishbone? <laughs> Change the context. You have four people who've been inside their church for 50 years. You can't just marry for money. Yay, I want to marry for love. I want, I want to marry for love and money. I like being rich. You can't be a witch for Halloween. What if there was a rich bone instead of a wishbone? I mean, it's just like... Here we got four denominations starting. <laughs> I want to, I wanna, uh, like, push you a little bit about something. We've been talking this weekend, and it's been fantastic. We've, been, we've had incredible conversations about our assurance in Jesus Christ. We have talked a lot about universal salvation, of which... I think every one of the speakers is in full agreement with. Uh, I am. You know, in, in that sense, I'm a universalist. Also, in, in, in addition to being a Christian Platonist. <laughs> I'm also a Baptist because I did that. And um, the Lord spoke to me one time, so I must be a charismatic. <laughs> and uh, I had dreams too. So, um, and they told me, um, Robin did, that we're part of a new age community. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I'm kind of like, Phew, hey, all things. This is great. Um, so, we've been talking about big picture stuff, and it's, it's beautiful, and it's good. And I love it. And I'm thrilled to be a part of this conversation. I'm thrilled to be invited into. All of us feel like we're honored to be here and uh, grateful. And that we were invited, even though we didn't sign a doctrinal position or a position paper on what this means, you know, and uh, whether we've, you know. There is this latitude, and it's here in the room. Trust me. Just talk to each other for a while. And then you'll have to learn how to love one another. So, because of our addiction for certainty and our addiction for being right. And we've got to lay some of that down. And part of listening is to allow what's being said to challenge the very basis and the core things that you have assumed to be true. That's listening. Listening is not listening so that you can rebut a conversation. And I want to be a listener. I'm learning how to be a listener. And because I've become a listener, to the degree that I have, I have learned all kinds of things. I want to talk to you about something, and I know that the language of this is going to rub up against some of your paradigms, some of your assumptions. And that's okay. And it's not what you think. I'm kind of going in a different direction. I have a friend of mine named, um, what's her name? Carol. Carol is a publisher in Germany. Not the publisher of The Shack. I met Carol because uh, she is part of a faith community and, and involved with publishing in Germany. And um, uh, Carol uh, 
Caroline, um, and I became friends at one of these big publishing kind of circus events. And, uh, you know, they hold these events, and you, you get to go, and it's, it's wild and crazy and fun. You get to have all these conversations. And, uh, and you walk into these massive auditoriums that are full of books. Um, I went down to the Biennale, which is the largest public book fair in the world in Brazil. Right? 1.1 million people came through in 11 days in Rio, right? And, um, and uh, most of the people in Rio, when they come through, the average is that they sell. This is a public book fair that is also has sales, and, and they buy, on average, three books, which is a big cost and expense in, in Brazil. And the shack is uh, the number two book in the history of Brazil. And um, it, it's... And Brazil is the same size physically as the continental United States. The only reason the U.S. is larger is because of Alaska. But the cartographers and the map makers early on who are American put the U.S. in the center and made it much bigger than it actually is and because we were the center of the universe. And, um, but Brazil is the same size. They don't have any distribution system on the ground. They don't have any network of, of highways and stuff to get stuff moved around. And so do you know who my number one distributor of the shack is in Brazil? Avon. <laughs> Avon has sold somewhere uh, uh, close to two and a half, three million copies of the shack. Because they go door to door and sell cosmetics and books. And uh, so um, it's, it is a, it is a, it's a beautiful thing to be part of a different cultural experience in terms of finding that your language resonated with the, the community down there. And, and uh, so I'm at, I'm at a book fair, and Caroline, uh, Carolina and I we became friends, and so we met different times. So at one point, we were in Orlando a few years ago, and she said to me, what are you working on right now? And I said, the four spiritual lies. And she said, what? I said, oh, you don't know Campus Crusade or, you know, when I was growing up, we had these four spiritual laws, right? And I've come to believe that all four of them are lies, which, I mean, you have to think about it. If you start with number two, you can be absolutely certain within this frame of reference that it's a lie because it says you've sinned and you're separated from God which you will never find in Scripture, but it sounds like a great idea. But it's the basis for all religion, right? As soon as you've sinned and separated from God, now you need somebody to tell you how to get unseparated. And they create this bridge, you know, so Jesus comes across the gap. It's, do you remember the three chairs, those of you who were here yesterday, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Let me bring one thing to real focus here. Those three chairs, there's nothing outside of it right? It's not like there's another room here where everybody's watching the three chairs, right? If you talk about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's nothing outside of it. Where do you think creation is created? It's created right here. So everything about creation, about your life, and everything is happening inside the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not outside of it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so the idea of separation is mythological. It's not actually true. We separated ourselves by turning away from life, love, goodness, truth, freedom, right? And we ended up in darkness, lies, bondage, right? Because of the shadow that we cast and that we thought was now real, as opposed to the love that we already included in. There is no creation outside of God. The New Testament's clear that creation is in Jesus. By, for, through, is sustained, held together. Not anything that has come into being has come into being apart from him. So if you want to know where creation is, it's in Christ. If you want to know where you are, you're in Christ. But I don't follow Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> the alternative is nothingness. You up for that? To be non-existent, right? Because everything that is made is made inside here. So every single human being is in Christ. And that's what Baxter said. The beauty of, of the situation at the cross is that everybody that is cursing and swearing at him are breathing Christological air. 
All right. That's not what I'm talking to you about, just so you know. So Carol asked me, what are you working on? I tell her the four spiritual lies. And she said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, we came up with this way of looking at, at God and codified it as if it was like in the Bible and stuff. And we created a bridge theology where Jesus is sent by God outside the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, outside to where creation is created. It's out here somewhere. And, and they've totally messed it up. So Jesus is sent as an emissary over here to build a bridge back to God. And so Jesus is the ticket taker sort of at the bridge. And if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you get to walk across the bridge. And depending on your theology, you could jump from the bridge at some point or, you know, it's just all kinds of different nuances. But it's still bridge theology, which is not the gospel. At least it wasn't in the early church, and it's not today. Jesus isn't the bridge. Jesus is the gospel. You're created in Christ. Your existence is in him. That's why you can never escape him. People, you know, they have all these conversations about hell, which I think are, are good conversations. And for me, hell is created inside the character and nature and being of God, which is love, and so it's an expression of love. It has to be. And it's either uncreated or it's created. If it's uncreated, then it is God, because God is the only uncreated. If it is created, then Romans says, let me tell you the things that cannot separate you from the love of God, and it includes anything present, anything future, and anything created. Good luck with that. <laughs> so I'm telling her about this, and I'm saying, well, she said, well, the first law, that... What's that? I said, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now that sounds pretty good, don't you think? I mean, when you first think about it, now forget for the moment that it's linked to this whole rest of this, the other three, which is the next one is you sinned and you're separated from God and you need a bridge now. Okay, so that logic begins here and it moves through this way. But on face value, it sounds wonderful. It sounds scriptural. It sounds right. Problem is, a couple, couple problems. One is, it seems like he loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life if. Or, yeah, he's got this wonderful plan. Now, I grew up where we were taught that there is the perfect will of God and the permissive will of God. I don't know if any of you came up with that kind of stuff, but I did. So the perfect will of God was like, what God wants to do with your life, and if you screw it up, you're going to end up with, shoot, he can't be a missionary now. We're going to have to make him um, like uh, something. Like a, what? we'll figure something out for him. But yeah, maybe a pastor. So, <laughs> right? And, and I'm growing up in a world where I'm not allowed to ask questions, and I'm going like, ah. Uh, can I ask how many sins it takes to screw up a perfect will of God? I'm thinking kind of one. Right? Because if God has got like this perfect plan and perfect will, right? Well, he's, he's perfect. So he's not going to be like, oh, so I'm going to use evil to accomplish the perfect will because that would be outside the character of God. So how many? I'm thinking one. Now, when I grew up, it had to be a big one. It wasn't just a little one. You had to commit adultery or something, which, you know. So, um, so it's like, okay, if you, if you don't, if you, if you fail at the perfect will of God, we got a backup plan called the permissive will of God. It's kind of like people who think that the universe is sort of a plan B because God knew we'd mess it up, so therefore he didn't do the best job, right? Which is bizarre. Of all the, all, all the infinite ways that God could have created, this is the best, which tells you that there was no way to create this high order of being who had the capacity to say no without them saying no. So the choice for God was, do we create or not? And anybody who has a, a child, it, even in the midst of antagonism with them, the question would not arise in your mind better that they'd never been born. Even when they're fighting with each other and they don't understand the beauty of the other, 
you don't think, well, it's better that they'd never been born. Not if you have any health at all. And that love originates in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we've got God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And I want to um, give you a different perspective about that. And I think this is incredibly helpful. It has been to me. And if you will allow it, uh, because I'm going to maintain that the sovereignty of God is real, right, and good. That is, that God is not only imminent with us inside of space-time, but is also the creator who is outside of space and time, who is the Alpha and the Omega. But I'm going to oppose the idea that God is in control. And this is really important. And this is where it might rub up. And some of it is just semantics. Because when I tell you what I'm going to tell you, you're going to go like, uh, yeah, I agree with that. But the language we use so dominates our perspective, and we don't understand the power of words. For example, we use the word church all the time to mean a building like this. It isn't. It's a community of people in relationship. And it can be two. You can't go to something you already are. But it doesn't stop us from talking like that. Um, how about this? I have a friend of mine who's an artist. We were, um, I went on a cruise for the first time in my life a couple years ago because I was the speaker. It was a music cruise. And um, um, so I, I meet him, and he's an incredible stage um, a live artist. He uses his hands. He paints. His name's Jared Emerson. And he, he paints with his hands up, and the, the pictures are upside down, and he does it within a very small piece of time while somebody's doing music. And, um, and they're incredible, just incredible. So we're talking. He meets me, and he want, he's read The Shack and stuff, and so he's talking to me, and at one point he says, I just want to be a tool used by God. I said, no, you don't. And he said, yeah, I do. Because that's all he knows, right? That's the way he grew up, and I grew up that way too. But we don't. I, I'm a sexual abuse survivor. You think I want anybody to use me? Even God? And I, so I said to uh, Jared, I said, hey, tell me about your relationship with your tools. You're an artist. You know, I know I, he does brush work and stuff. So do you talk to your brushes? Do you tell them, like, I'm really having a hard day? And, and what do they say to you? Right? You don't have a relationship with tools. God is all about relationship. God doesn't use us, and God doesn't heal us because he wants to use us. He heals us because he loves us. And then he invites us to play. This is a God of relationship. So Carol, we're talking about this, and I start telling her about what I'm about to share with you, and she, she says, I need, an, I need to understand this. Do you mean that there is no big plan out there that God is matching my behavior to? And I said, no, it doesn't work like that. It's not that God isn't sovereign, but God is not in control. You know, as soon as God creates one being that can say no, God is no longer in control. I mean, he could be. I mean, if, if he's just saying, well, you don't really have a choice, you know. You can't, you can't really say no. As soon as you say no, I'll snuff you out of existence, you know. <laughs> but that's not what happens, right? Do you know that in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's free? They are free to love one another, to submit to one another, to celebrate one another, right? It's beautiful. It's the intention. So Carol says to me, after we talk, she goes, this is really important. What I don't know, here's what I don't know, and she tells me later, her best friend is a young man who loves Jesus, um, an athlete who was doing a live television on camera stunt in Germany. 
and something went horribly wrong. And now he can move one finger. And it's been devastating, huge loss. And people in my family, my Christian fundamentalist brothers and sisters, my people, they would come because people a lot of times who don't know better say stupid things, especially religious people, because we've got God in our back pocket along with all the other excuses and justifications. So they would say things like, look at the testimony and the plan of God for your son, and look what God has done in terms of now giving your son a platform to talk about God in a way that he couldn't before. And this young man's mother had a crisis of faith because the idea is God broke my son's body so that he could get some attention. That this is the will of God. That this is the plan of God. And I told Carol that I don't believe that God is a divine planner. I believe he's more of a creator artist. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Some religious people Some of my people, and I've, I'm, I'm right in the middle of this. I've, I've done this. Carol didn't want to talk about God's wonderful plan for our lives. How, how do you talk about a God who is loving and powerful and then move to tragedy, sickness, accident, calamity, and finally make it worse by actually believing that we're, honored, we're honoring God somehow by making him the author of these things? If God is the author of evil, you cannot trust him. If God is not good all the time, you cannot trust God. Legitimately so. And you will not trust God until you believe that he is not only for you, but is for you all the time. To the degree that you know God loves you, to that degree, you won't be afraid. First John, right? Some religious people and Christians would be among the ranks, believe in a very grim determinism. It's fatalism with personality. Right? That when bad things happen, it's because this is God's will and God's plan. There is an impassable chasm, except perhaps in our darkened imaginations, between a God who takes ownership for the creation, along with all of its havoc that we have brought to the table, and a God who authors the evil within it. This creation is created in Christ. Christ takes ownership. Jesus takes ownership of the creation and all of humanity and the choices that we've made. But is not the author of evil. Doesn't even tempt anybody. James. First John. Let me tell you about this God that we learned from Jesus. He is, he is light and in him there is no darkness at all. How often have we heard well-meaning and well-intentioned words like, must be part of God's plan? Really? Might it be that something is just simply wrong? This is wrong? There is no justification for much of what we've brought to the table. Do you think there's a justification for the cross, what we did to Jesus? That's a torture device. We brought it to the table. That didn't originate in God because God is light and in him there is no darkness at all and that is a dark torture machine. There is no light about this thing at all. The beauty is that God can take what we bring to the table as the iconic fist in the face, I hate you, damn you, to God and by submitting to it, climbs on it, and not only destroys its power, but transforms it into an icon and a monument so precious that we will wear it on our rings and around our necks. A torture device. That's a God who climbs into the world, our world, and submits to our stuff in order to transform us and it. 
something we cannot do ourselves. Even if God has the creative audacity to build purpose out of evil that we create, which is creative audacity, it will never justify what is wrong. Nothing, not even the salvation of the entire cosmos could ever justify a horrific torture device called the cross. That God would submit to our darkness and transform it into an icon and a monument of grace. Does God have a wonderful plan for my life, for your life? Does God sit up and up there and draw a perfect will for you and me on some cosmic disconnected drafting table, a perfect plan that requires a perfect response? Is God then left to react to our stupidity or deafness or blindness or inability as we constantly violate perfection with our own indelible ink? What if this is about a God who has greater respect for you than he has for any plan? Now, I'm not saying that God did not know what God was going to do about the destruction we would bring to the table from the beginning because Jesus is slain from the foundation of the world, but not slain by God, by us. What if there is no plan in that sense of disconnected will for our lives, but rather, what if there is a relationship in which God constantly invites you and me to co-create, respectfully submitting to our choices that we bring to the table, and because that's, that God is love, will never be satisfied until only that which is of love's kind will remain in us. What if God has greater respect for you than you do? Guess what? God has greater respect for you than you do. Why does evil exist? Because God has respect for our ability to say no. That your ability to choose to say no matters to God. Because if you can't say no, then your yes has no meaning. Without your ability to say no, love cannot exist. Nor relationship. So for my birthday, Carol sent me a gift. This is what I talked to Carol about. And she sent me a gift. She took this book that is only in the German, and she translated a little section out of it. It's by Martin Schleske, who's one of the great violin makers in the world. And Martin had read The Shack, and Carol had talked to him about The Shack and stuff like this. And Martin had written a book, and Carol translated a little section, and I want to read it to you. Here's Carol's comments at the beginning. You'll love this. Trust me. Okay, hang in there. At first, Martin writes a lot of fascinating things about the wood that he uses in the violin's body. Only one sort of trees from a certain area in the mountains are formed by rough weather and winds and meager ground which produces resilient wood that is elastic at the same time. He sometimes spends months seeking the right tree by going through the woods, tapping on them with a tuning fork. In the old time, the violin builders found their singer trunks, because that's what Martin's looking for. They're called singer trunks. In the old times, they, the violin makers would gather where rivers ran into each other. All the harvested wood was floated down. And when they banged into each other, some of them made melodic sounds when they bounced. That, that revealed themselves as the singers. Every hardship that those trees experienced made the roots go deeper and the stru structural fibers stronger, but all crooked in a little way this or that. If a tree, listen to this. This is in Martin's book, and Carol's just explaining it to me. In a tree close to the chosen one, the singer, fell. So if a tree near the singer falls down, the different angle of light and wind made the entire trunk twist a little bit, which also showed up now in every fiber. Other characteristics emerge in every millimeter of the wood, and each is absolutely unique. Each of these singers is unique. 
The wood is then stored for years in the workshop under certain heat and humidity conditions until it is ready for the purpose to become a violin body. Now the violin builder starts cutting the body's bulge, the curvature, out of it that is uniquely crucial for giving the violin its own unique voice. That's the end of Caro's comments. Now the quote from Martin Schleske. It would be cheap to force one's perception on the wood. The art of seeing what the fiber requires is the work of the artist. Someone fixated on the ideal or right shape will only follow his laws. The artist, who also knows about the laws of acoustics, sees something else. He honors what is crooked and what has become in the fibers and knows that these must not be cut in the wrong places. Only then is this evolution, this transformation, a spiritual one, where inner wisdom and knowledge of the wood and its needs are uppermost, and not blind perception to form. The perfectionist is content with fulfilling the law. The artist fulfills the sound. And then he quotes Romans 8, describing a similar process. By the way, Martin loves Jesus. Quote, And those who love God know that all things work together for good for those who are called according to purpose. Those he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those he predestined he called. Those he called he justified. Those he justified he also glorified. Quote, it's quite, it's really quite similar to working out the violin's bulge or curvature. The wood is carefully chosen, called. A good violin builder respects the texture of the wood, and under his fingers he feels the character, the solidity, the density. This shows him both the possibilities and the limits of the wood. Each of this wood's quirks and characteristics has an influence on the sound that it will bring forth. Some trees, like people, have suffered staggering hardships and overwhelming winds in their life. The course of our fibers becomes difficult, one-sided, crooked, and scarred. But like the wood, we reveal our true selves during the small and great ordeals of our lives. These knock on our life and thus make our fibers, our inner structure, audible. If I, as a violin maker, writes Martin, am willing to work with the kind of fiber I get and start creating with what has already become and what is difficult and crooked, how much more will God do this? God's wisdom knows what is necessary to build a unique sound from our unique texture our fiber, and our sometimes difficult histories. This is what is meant by called, justified, and glorified in the text. I will only become a master artist creator when I am willing to work with a despite, despite this particular flaw, this odd structure, this damage. I will give this wood its voice. I will make it sing. While I'm working on a curvature on the bulge, I sometimes feel the planer, you know, the planer, take a different approach. This shows me here I have to leave the idea of the curve that I had in mind. It may not be pretty, but necessary. Everything that has happened to this wood requires asymmetry. If the fibers were lines definable by math, one could construct an ideal curve, an ideal form already defined before the work even begins. But fiber courses cor are coarse are not perfect, not ideal, and thus the making of a violin body is not a construction site. It is an act of creation. Listen to me. It's an act of creation because it is not the wood that yields to the master. It is the master who yields to the wood.
It is an act of creation because it is not the wood that yields to the master. It is the master who yields to the wood. The artist has to ask himself what he has on hand. How did this wood grow? What can it become? The intent of the process of creation allows for promised possibilities to unfold. This cannot happen through a rigid plan. Everything depends on the esteem and the wisdom of the master for the creation. For our view of life, it is a great difference if we see the world as a creation or a construction. It is not the idea of evolution that robs faith of its breath, but thinking that the world is a divine construction site is what robs faith of its breath. This is the difference between a plan and a promise, between subordination and a dialogue, between religion and faith. An almighty engineer subdues the material. Faith in God then means to submit to God. Building violence has taught me otherwise. Creating relates to both what is given and to what has already become. Faith means to trust in the indwelling wisdom of the Creator and the promised possibilities. This is proven in the process itself. The wood finds its own voice in being born again. When I feel the fibers through the roughness of my planer, it is like a dialogue with the wood. Only while I'm working on it do I get clarity of how that curve should be. The wood has its say in this joint creation. A construction is a forcing of a predetermined ideal on the material. Everything has to yield to that idea. Now we're at the heart of legalism where life is coded in and subdued by unrelenting ideal conceptions. We have arrived at the curse of religion. The justification of man, as it says in Romans, first and foremost means that there is a wisdom at work that does justice to life. The real fibers of our life, our histories, what we've gone through are respected, and they're given a voice. It is an act of love that embraces the imperfect and sees its worth. It is an act of love. Love sees all the beauty, joy, desire, hope, the possibilities of the soul, but it also sees all the weaknesses, the disappointments, the sadness, and the pain, the crooked fibers. God's wisdom gets involved in a dialogue in which we have a natural say. Our life is not a construction. It is not done on a drawing board. Creation means that everything that is in the making is becoming in regard to what has already grown. This is brilliant. In a construction, everything that is in the making is under the constraint of what is wanted. That is insufficient and it's pathetic. Scripture shows me that God has the heart of an artist, not a grim construction planner. If the world were the work of a cosmic engineer, he would be in a constant state of discontentedness. We would all suffer from the constant nagging of a dogged designer whose plans just never work out like he intended or expected. Reality could never live up to his spotless, perfect creation plans construction plans, but a true creator knows he not only has to shape, but also endorse and allow. Wisdom allows things to grow and unfold. It is fascinating to view the whole world, world as a composition, a painting or a sculpture, or scenes from a great work of art. Works of art can be beautiful and they can be odd. I am certain that God, having the heart of an artist, has no intention to force reality to obey him at all costs. Wisdom does not know grim determination. The thought of seeing every person as a work of art in progress, an ever-changing and unique expression of God, changes our whole view of the world and ourselves. Suddenly, we can see the odd, authentic, fascinating, enjoyable, staggering interplay of what is created and what has become of it. What was put into this person and what has grown out of it and what is in the making 
we could see people as forms of expressions of a great artist, expressions that yearn to be seen, read, and heard. Do you know what this is saying? That is saying that God wastes nothing, not even all the damage that I perpetrated. He doesn't justify it. There are things that my choices meant that I lost. There are realities in my relationship Kim, with Kim that I lost. And God gathered up all the bits and pieces, all of my experiences and the winds that had ravaged my heart. And with kindness and knowing me, begins to work out this work of art that will have a sound unlike any other sound in the cosmos. You're made for that. And this is a God who submits to you and to what you brought to the table as, what a, as well as what other people did. Every time a baby is born, God submits to the will of two people for whatever motivation, evil or otherwise, and joins with them to place in this person eternal existence and submits to their genetic code what they have brought to the table, which is histories of parents and grandparents and great-great-parents, grandparents, and people who have done damage in the world and pesticides and, and the ravages of this culture. And out of that comes a child sometimes that is mangled by the choices of humanity, but never by the love of God or the intent of God or the goodness of God. This is an artist who respects the creation and what you've brought to it and then will co-create with you. I have a friend, Rob Parsons. I've got a couple things and I'm done. My friend, Rob Parsons, he published a book called Wisdom House in the UK. Here is an excerpt that, that bears on this conversation. It isn't just seeming physical disadvantages that can turn into a strength, but life experiences also, even ones that, that others would naturally run from. Some years ago, a friend of mine attended a lecture on stem cell research at Oxford given by a world-famous geneticist. During the question time, the scientist was asked whether in the future it would be possible to clone Beethoven. His answer was a brilliant, is Rob here? A brilliant yes and no. Yes, if you could distract the, extract the DNA from the bones of his coffin, you could create a human being who would be an identical twin to Beethoven. Yes, you could probably teach this twin to play the piano in a reasonably high level. But no. You see, Beethoven's father, who was also his music tutor, was a violent alcoholic. The young Beethoven was very close to his mother who died when he was a teenager, and he became responsible to raising his two brothers as his father lapsed deeper into his alcoholism. He lost his first and only true love. He lived in poverty, weighed down with debts. He suffered from manic depression, and like his father, he turned to alcohol. Then, just as Beethoven began to lose began to have some interest in his compositions, he began to lose his hearing. The culmination of all of this experience, the tumultuous feelings of rage, love, despair, and passion were poured into his most famously pounding six symphonies, numbers three to eight, which we now revere as classical Beethoven. More accomplished musicians may now play or conduct his works, but they will never capture his greatness because that quality was born out of his expressions of his own life experience of being true to himself. And finally, from George MacDonald, writing in 1868, one of his novels, the scene is Robert, Robert Falconer's Righteous grandmother has burned his violin, his fiddle. The one that had been his father's and his grandfather's. 
and she burned it lest it would lead Robert astray. Here's the quote from George MacDonald. But though the loss of Miss St. John and the piano was the, was, the last, was the last blow, his sorrow did not rest there, but returned to brood over his bonny leddy, that his violin. She was scattered to the winds. His grandmother had burned it up. Would any of her ashes, ashes ever arise in the corn and moan in the ripening wind of autumn? Might not some atoms of the bonny leddy creep into the pines on the hill whose soft and soul-like sounds had taught him to play the flowers of the forest on those strings, which like the nerves of an amputated limb yet thrilled through his being? Or might not some particle find its way by winds and waters to sycamore forests of Italy and there creep up through the channels of its life to some finely rounded curve of a noble tree on the side that ever looks sunward and be chosen once again by the violin hunter to be wrought into a new and fame-gathering instrument? Could it be that his body led he had learned her wondrous music in those forests, from the shine of the sun and the sighing of the winds through the sycamores and the pines, for Robert knew that the broad-leafed sycamore and the sharp needle-leaved pine had each its share in the violin. Only as the wild innocence of human nature, uncorrupted by wrong, untaught by suffering, is to that nature struggling out of darkness into light, such and so different is the living wood with its sweetness, sweetest tones of obedient impulse, answering only to the wind which bloweth where it listeth, to that wood chosen, separated, individualized, tortured into strange, almost vital shape after a law to us nearly unknown, strung with the strings from animal organizations and put into the hands of a man to utter the feelings of a soul that had passed through a like history. This Robert could not think and had to grow able to think it by being himself made an instrument of God's music. I am today a unique sound that I will not be tomorrow and the tomorrow after that, but could not be except for today. What if, what if there is a God who could gather up all the broken bits of two fish and five loaves of my life and co-create with me purpose out of what was stolen from me and then what I broke and gather up every bit so that not one bit of it was lost. If that were true, it would change everything. <laughs> 